Welcome to Heaven Awaits. My name is Lee, and I narrate the near-death experiences of those who have died and have seen the other side. If you enjoy these videos, please consider hitting the thumbs up, subscribe, and bell icons to be notified of new content. Doing so is free, and it does help the channel grow. To my returning viewers, I'm glad to have you back. I just want to let everyone know that some of the things talked about in today's experience do involve assaults in prison. Be warned. Get comfortable, grab a cup of coffee or tea, and let's dive into today's experience. Hi, Lee. I hope that you don't mind that I call you by your name instead of Heaven Awaits. I am writing to share with you my experience of being dead. I want to start by telling people this isn't pretty and what they hear will likely cause them issues. I am a murderer. In 1993, I killed my best friend. I know what you and your listeners must be thinking. How do you kill your own best friend? Would you believe me if I told you it was accidental? Yeah, me either. It was, though. Maybe we shouldn't have been playing with my dad's weapons. I don't wish to get into the details of what was involved. Even though all of that is in the past now, it still brings me to tears thinking about it. I was charged with manslaughter and sentenced to 12 years in prison. From my understanding, the judge looked at my previous record when deciding my sentence. I wasn't always the good citizen that I am today. I don't know what I was expecting in prison when I was finally transferred from the county in 1994 to what would be my home for the next 12 years. Indian Creek Correctional was top of the line when it opened. Of course, in prison, everyone was expected to stay with their race. Even if you didn't have a racist bone in your body, if you were white, you were to stay with the whites, blacks stayed with blacks, and so on. There is a reason we call prisons the most segregated places in America. Getting caught talking to someone outside of your race was a no-no, something that wasn't heavily enforced in the county, but to those who are doing life, well, to them, it is the law. I didn't get into any of that stuff. I found it to be quite ridiculous, but that didn't stop others from following the segregation laws to an absolute T. The first time I broke this rule, I was caught talking to a black guy that I had been in the county with. He and I got along all right, but the other whites didn't like that. I remember later that day, I was called down to the big dog's cell and ordered to explain myself. The big dog was the head of that prison's AB, Aryan Brotherhood chapter that was serving three consecutive life sentences. I was forced to explain why I was caught talking with the insert nasty word that racists use and was asked if I was a traitor to my race. This sort of talk caught me off guard as I had never heard such vile words come out of people's mouths. I had to explain why I was caught talking to him and why I would talk to him to begin with. I don't know whether this guy felt sorry for me or realized that I was fresh meat to the prison system, but he explained everything in detail and kept the other whites from putting a prison beating on me. He was the one who told me whites stay with whites, blacks with blacks, and Latins with Latins, though he used much more degrading terms. I thanked him for not killing me and made my way back to my cell. I knew that I was pretty much a marked man from that point forward. For eight years, I managed to keep my nose clean and avoid all of the gang politics in prison. I saw people get the old prison beat down. I also saw multiple race incidents. I truly wanted to serve my time and get out of prison. December 2002, I was on kitchen duty and unfortunately, on kitchen duty, you have no choice but to communicate with those outside of your race especially if you want to get stuff done. Even then, you're supposed to keep the conversation to a minimum, or else someone will rat you out and, well, let's just say that isn't a lot of fun. I forget what I said to the guy that I needed to talk to. Perhaps it was something along the lines of, do you need help finishing those dishes? But it caused someone to tell the AB guys that I was getting a little too chummy with the insert racist word. I was called back down to his cell, and as soon as I walked in, I was met with a punch to my face. I didn't have a chance to explain what was going on or anything. I don't remember what happened next. All I remember was waking up in the infirmary with a swollen lip and a gash above my left eye. It took a while, but I found out that as soon as he had hit me, about ten others had jumped on me and they kept beating me until I went limp. They then threw me out onto the gangway and left me there bleeding. It wasn't until a guard was making his rounds that I was found. All that I had done was ask someone of a different color than me if they needed help with dishes to be on the bad side of the whites for the remainder of my stay. My skin color made me an enemy to all. It didn't matter that I had done nothing wrong. I had been perceived as a race traitor, 
which meant that I had zero help from the other whites in prison. My final four years were absolute hell. If you imagine prison life and you imagine what just went through your head reading that, you would be right. Yes, that happened. It only happened twice as far as I am aware, but I'd be a liar to say it didn't. It seemed like every other month I was being jumped by one group or another, and as I said, since I was considered a race traitor, there was a standing order that if any white person helped me or sought revenge for me, they would meet my same fate or worse. Every time commissary came around, I was jumped for it before I finally told my dad to stop sending money to me. Finally, people left me alone. In my final year in prison, I had finally had enough and snapped. I was going to get some sort of payback on the people who made the last four years of my life hell. I approached the AB leader and shanked him with a homemade shank that I made out of my toothbrush. I watched as he dropped to the ground, holding his kidney area. It was not enough to kill him, but it did give him pause to mess with me again. There's an old saying, live by the sword, die by the sword. I had to grow eyes in the back of my head and pretty much avoided everyone that I could. Five months before my scheduled release, he got his revenge. To this day, I have no idea where he got this piece of metal, but he opened up a deep cut on my stomach from one side to the other before I could do anything. I immediately fell to the floor and was gone. I found myself looking down at my body as the guards immediately forced everyone into lockdown. Blood was steadily pooling around my midsection where he had sliced me. When people tell you that they feel indifferent when looking at their bodies, that is true. I did not feel any connection to my body at all. I continued to look down as the guards and nurse they brought with them worked on me, suddenly feeling an extreme pulling sensation downward. As I was pulled downward, I could hear painful screaming and moaning. I could hear gnawing and chewing and cussing. The pulling eventually morphed into a falling feeling, and all of a sudden, I found myself standing on what appeared to be a rocky surface surrounded by fire. The heat was more intense than what I imagine a thousand suns would feel like. I could barely breathe as I muttered a feeble, hello. To my surprise, when I muttered that, it seemed like all of the screaming voices went away, and all I heard was a cackle so evil that I can't describe it in words. Welcome home, Sam, a bodiless voice said. Who's there? Show yourself, I demanded of the voice. The being that appeared to me didn't look any different from a regular human, perhaps a bit more reddish, but I could tell that this being was evil to the core. There was nothing redeemable about this thing. I asked hesitantly, Who are you? To which he replied, You humans call me many names. I prefer Lucifer. You can't be. This isn't real. This is a dream. I'm a good person. I screamed at the one proclaiming to be the devil. You, a good person, sneered the being. Let's see if you truly are as he brought up the most hideous things I have done in life to be reviewed. You killed your best friend, and even after that, you felt little to no remorse. Good people don't do the stuff in life that you have done. The devil showed me things I had done in prison that I was not proud of, but did anyway. Things that I will not describe to you because of how bad they were. He showed me my thoughts on the day that I killed my best friend. Thoughts that I didn't know were even there. He showed me where I had thought how cool it would be for the gun to go off and for the bullet to end up in the exact place it ended up. Sam, do you still consider yourself a good person? Lucifer hissed in delight knowing that he had broken me. Oh my God, Jesus, no. What have I done? I said and noticed Lucifer screaming in pain and screaming out. Do not mention those names in my domain, murderer. They cannot help a lost soul like you. It was then that I looked up and begged God with all of my heart to save me from the grasp of Lucifer. I begged for forgiveness for killing my friend and for every bad thing that I had ever done. I felt myself being tugged in the opposite direction while hearing Lucifer hiss that it wasn't fair, that I belonged with him. I don't know how long I was pulled upward toward the heavens, but when I got there, my friend who I had killed years earlier was waiting there for me. Danny, I'm sorry. I'm so sorry. He smiled as if to say he knew and forgave me. Danny looked behind him and back at me, and I heard in my head that it was time to go home. I remember saying, no, I don't want to go back to hell. Please don't send me back. Danny smiled and said these words in my head. You aren't going there. God has heard you and has forgiven you, and I have forgiven you. But you have to finish your time on earth. Your time has not yet come. 
I muttered again that I was sorry and found myself falling, and falling as if I had been launched out of a machine directly to my body. I slammed into my body and immediately gasped in pain. I think the nurse almost had a heart attack because she immediately screamed and fainted. The doctor who had worked on me came in to find me sitting up and told me that they thought they had lost me, that there was no way that I should have survived with that much blood loss. I found out later that the object he had used to cut me open did not come from inside the prison, which means that he had a guard on his payroll. No one ever figured out which guard it was, though I have my suspicions. I spent my remaining time in the infirmary recovering. I am willing to provide pictures of the scar across my stomach for those who do not believe this. I want to tell everyone that as long as you still believe in God, even if you are in hell like I was, if you ask for forgiveness it will be granted. The reason why some souls stay in hell is that they have long since forgotten about God or refuse to put their pride aside and beg for help. I became born again. Every day I wear the shame of what I did in prison and before prison, but every day I heal a little bit more. I still find myself looking behind me everywhere I go. Once you get on the AB's bad side, you are marked for life. Perhaps nothing will come of it, but again it doesn't stop me from keeping a close eye on my surroundings. That does it for today's experience. What do you guys think of the time that he spent in hell? Do you think that he is saved, or that it was a trick that Lucifer played on him? I want to hear your thoughts on this one. Until the next time, stay safe and continue to be blessed.